My mind just went blank. What just happened? <laughs> You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. And today we are revisiting an episode from a year ago with a whole lot of twists to it. So this is going to be super fun. It's a breeze. How to Lutheran. If you remember last year, we talked about Chrismans and we all made a Chrisman and gave it away to somebody. It was super fun and also really labor intensive for several of us. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not doing that again. Uh, however, we're revisiting Chrismans because they're awesome. And Bree's going to tell us some more crazy stuff about Chrismans. Yeah. So if you listen to last year's episode about Chrismans, Prior to that, I had no knowledge of like what they were, what the history was. I cheekily referred to them as fancy Jesus ornaments. <laughs> um, but like my appreciation for them since that episode has grown. And I think as I've been thinking about, you know, looking forward into Advent and Christmas this year, I think the the most fascinating part to me in Talking about Chrismons is really like the images and the symbols that you see used and sort of linking them to who Jesus is or what our lives as Christians are like. I mean, obviously you have the common symbols of like crosses and circles or triangles to represent the Trinity, the Jesus fish. Like you, you see these very commonly used symbols and they are great symbols. Believe me, there's nothing wrong with them however i also know that there are symbols and images out there that i don't know that they would strike me as being a, like a christian symbol and so you look at things like boat anchors there's a lot of like nautical imagery so like there is boat anchors and sand dollars, the sh like the scallop shell, I can understand because you've got the baptism imagery there. But, but you also have things like bells and lamps and pelicans that like rip their chests open to feed their babies. I love like, the pelican. It's just, yeah, <laughs> birds and nautical imagery. I I don't know. I, and don't forget the butterflies. The butterfly. Oh, the butterfly. Yeah. So. It's just, it's a fun, it's, it's been sort of a fun thing for me to think about. And as we look to the Advent season, the more I think about it, the more I realize, you know, you have these most commonly used Chrismon images or symbols or patterns. As much as I've tried to look, I don't think that there is a definitive lexicon, like a definitive book of of what qualifies as a chrismon obviously you know you can't just have any old image or symbol be a chrismon like nobody's gonna make a chrismon out of a cat unless it's a lion <gasps> a lion could do it or broccoli or a hangnail <laughs> like <laughs> There's stupid and evil stuff in this world that you don't probably don't want to make a chrismon out of. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's just not, it's not going to happen. And so what I want to discourage you from doing is taking this episode to the nth degree and like trying to link some obscene image or something because you think you're edgy and funny and like try to make a chrismon out of it. Okay. First of all, I went there. It's not that funny. Okay. Just <laughs> don't go there. My mind went there and it was awful. And I prayed for forgiveness afterwards. It's not that funny. Even so, I am, I will forever be enchanted by what the Chrismon is and how we can take ordinary everyday items and sort of see the divine in them to sort of be reminded of who Jesus is what he's done for us just in everyday items that you might have just laying around your house. So here's what we're going to do today. Why not add some ordinary 
everyday items to the library of crosses, geometric shapes, floral motifs, shells, and birds. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I repeat, this episode is only for funsies. And I might proof text the heck out of this episode, but my intent is not to twist scripture or mock our faith or dearly held Christian traditions. Don't at me. This is for funsies. Don't burn me at the stake for being a heretic. That's not my intent today. So I have five Chrismon patterns slash images that I would like to submit to the Chrismon authorities for implementation <laughs> into the official Chrismon library that should exist but doesn't. I can't even wait. I know. <laughs> and with the images that I've that I am submitting today, I am also going to include scriptural evidence as to why they are Christian symbols to basically get lend credibility to why I think these should be submitted and used in the future. I think this is a beautiful exercise. Um, Thank you. Remember that there was a time in history. I don't like to think about it because it sounds dark. There was a time in history when the Pelican did not yet represent Christ's self-sacrificial love for his church. But we live after that time. Right now we are living in a time before the symbols, whichever symbols you're going to put forward, are recognized as symbols of God's love for his people. But I guess you're going to make a firm case for why we should be so moving toward the other side of that history. We so are fun. we are at a great turning point. We get to see this moment in history. <laughs> we have been here for both the before and the after. And I'm so glad you guys are here with me to do this. Yeah. Because if I go down, you're coming with me. We are with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this first one actually was invented in my mind. During an episode that we recorded earlier this year, and I don't remember which one it was. I don't either. Hmm. But I would like, Sarah, I would like you to open your Bible to Psalm 24. You'll be reading verses 8 through 10. Rachel, Isaiah 53, 5. And Aaron, Matthew 2, verse 11. The image, number one, that I would like to submit to the Chrismon authorities is... The pineapple. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love this one. This one might so be my good. new favorite. It is so good. So, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and read that passage from Psalm 24? All right. Psalm 24, verses 8 through 10. Who yes. is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. So Jesus is our king of glory, and like the king of glory, the pineapple has a crown atop its head, and the crown of the pineapple reminds us then that Jesus is our king of glory. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay, I am reading Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. So I think the so when I look at the outside of a pineapple, it's got like those like sp they're not that sharp, but they're like spiny and uncomfortable. And I think when mm -hmm. I when I feel the sides of a pineapple, I'm reminded of Jesus bearing the you know the nails and the spear in his side. Like we can be reminded of how he died by observing and experiencing. The spines of a pineapple. Aaron, why don't you go ahead and read Matthew 2, verse 11. Do it. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So, the pineapple, in my experience, is probably the sweetest fruit that I've ever eaten. and. Here's the thing. Here was probably the biggest challenge for me in coming up with these these alter these <laughs> next generation Chrismons was a lot of the characteristics that I was trying to assign to these everyday objects was already being assigned in the Bible to something else. So like 
in the Psalms or the it's Psalms or Proverbs or both. It talks about the sweetness of kind words. I think it's Proverbs. It talks about the sweetness of kind words, but it's likened to honeycomb. And I'm like, God, but it's not honeycomb, guys. I need it to be pineapple. Give me pineapple. (laughs) So then I thought about it a little bit more. And you think about the gifts of the Magi. You've got the gold, which is the inside of the pineapple, is it's its flesh, mm-hmm. the sweetness of mm-hmm. of the spices that they brought. Mm-hmm. And so when I cut open a pineapple and I eat a pineapple, it's it's kind of it's kind of it's representative of those gifts given to Jesus by the Magi when they visited him. Wonderful. I love it. I have yet another reason why the pineapple is a wonderful thing. I I always love this, that pineapples, you see them in a lot of old houses, mm-hmm. you know, like stair knobs and, yes. and door yep. knockers and things like that. Well, the pineapple in America, at least, was originally so rare and so precious that it was served only to the most honored guests. And so it was a real symbol of hospitality. I think I heard once that some people would actually rent pineapples, just not to eat them, put them on the table, uh, look fancy when the company came so they could show hospitality because they were so rare and precious. And that I think is a wonderful metaphor for Christ who is the host and the feast, you know, hospitality Mm -hmm. is, is his gift to us. And he is rare and precious and everything you've said, Brie, I definitely second your nomination for the pineapple into the Chris Mon club. I I legitimately love this one. Like I want to make a pineapple Chris Mon right now. It's there's so much symbolism. And I mean, it's also, it's a beautiful graphic. Like it's one that would be easily Mm -hmm. recognizable. Like you choose another, the orange would not work. It's just going to be, you're not going to be able to represent that as a Christmas. It's just a circle. It's no, <laughs> but the pineapple <laughs> that you can see, you can see and recognize what it is. So I think it also functionally works well as it's a Christmas. True. It's true. But let's talk about one that might be a little more obscure yeah. then. So we're going to show you guys ready for number two. <laughs> let's do it. Okay. <laughs> The second Chrismon symbol that I would like to submit to the authorities today is a roll of duct tape. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the Bible and find out why. <laughs> Let's do. Sarah, please go to yes. First Chronicles chapter 16. Uh-huh. Rachel, John 6. You'll be reading verse 27. Yes, ma'am. And Aaron Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. So, take it away, Sarah. I love this so much. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So, this is sort of a a riff on the circle being the a symbol of eternity for God's love and his faithfulness to us. So I thought, hmm, you don't really associate duct tape with Jesus, and I think that this is sort of an interesting take because it comes in a, in a circular roll. It doesn't, it, I don't use duct tape enough for it to be like, I need to go out and buy like a new roll of duct tape every year or whatever, every three weeks. So it, that lasts pretty long too. Like application wise, it's it it symbolizes eternity, I feel like. But it also represents eternity in, in, in another way when we, when Rachel, if you would read John chapter 6, verse 27. You got it. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Thank you. So we also await the return of Jesus to live life eternal with him, which we are guaranteed in our baptism. And we learn about when we worship together. And so with that, when we talk about sort of being together as a community, we look to Colossians 3 to think about ideal ways for us to be together. So go ahead, Aaron. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So 
I saw a video on YouTube the other day of these <laughs> kids that duct tape themselves to the wall. And that's a pretty that's that's a pretty strong bond. And so when I think about the bond of duct tape and how strong that is, and that that does not even begin to compare to the bond that Jesus has with us and the the bond that we have with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, um, we can still look at a roll of duct tape and and thank God for that reminder. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm submitting roll of duct tape as Chrismon Next Generation symbol number two. It lasts. Shall we continue? Forever. Yes, it's okay. even it. silver. Isn't it's there even verse silver. About more precious than silver. Oh yeah. Wow. That is a good one. <laughs> Silver sticky stuff in a ring. That's perfect. Yep. Yes, absolutely. This next one might seem a bit of a no-brainer, but I'm putting it out there anyway. Rachel, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And Aaron, go ahead and turn to Psalm 51, verses 10 and 12. So number th- symbol number three is a bar of soap. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> And I was going to make Sarah read the entire book of Leviticus for you, but we don't quite have the time. We'll make that into a separate podcast. We'll make that into a separate (laughs) podcast. But basically, a lot of what the book of Leviticus talks about is like cleanliness laws. And if you read that book, there's really some gross, disgusting parts about it that I don't. I don't like and added to the fact that that is ultimately considered a sin in Jewish law. And whether we're reading the book of Leviticus or just living our everyday lives on this side of the resurrection, looking, looking through the cross to both old and new Testament, like the law accuses us at every moment. And so we pray for God's grace and providence to save us from that every day and thankfully we have a solution to that in this this section from luke chapter 22 if you would not mind reading that for us rachel not at all verse 20 and likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood right so the covenants that we saw in the old testament that we we focus on the Levitical laws for basically what Jesus does when he institutes this passage from, you know, instituting the, the Lord's Supper. He ushers in this new covenant now that because of his sacrifice for us, his blood, it cleans us. Our sins have been washed away because of what he does for us. And because of that, we are mindful of that as Christians. And so at least once a week, we pray for clean hearts and renewed spirits like King David did when he was convicted by his sin with Bathsheba. So Aaron, if you would not mind reading Psalm 51 verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So we pray this, these exact words every Sunday, if that's part of your order of service. And we know, like we have, we have the confidence that God will bring that to us when we confess that we are poor, miserable sinners. Jesus comes and cleanses us of that. His sacrifice takes care of that for us. And just as an editor's note, I opted (laughs) for bar of soap imagery because I always got a mouthful of liquid palm olive when I was a kid for cussing when I would do that. And it obviously didn't do anything but traumatize me. So bar <laughs> um, I think for some people it might be the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So well, let's move on. <laughs> yes, let's. No, there's so much good washing imagery. As you were talking, Brie, mm-hmm. I thought of like half a dozen more scriptures than what you pulled out for uh, for our attention and the one that really just uh, is in my brain right now is from revelation chapter 7 
He says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. That Christ makes us clean. And Mm. so, yes, a bar of soap is a wonderful symbol of that. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. The fourth symbol on our list to be submitted is an umbrella. Yes. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind opening up to Exodus chapter 14, you're going to be reading verses 19 and 20. Rachel, Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. Hosea? Yes. Hosea. Hosea. (laughs) I went deep for this one. I get nervous about Hosea. (laughs) And then Aaron, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Go ahead, Sarah. All right. Exodus 14. Then the angel of God who is going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So one of the reasons that I chose Umbrella is the imagery that we see throughout the Bible of God either shielding or protecting people from danger, from evil. And I guess I guess I could have just used a literal shield, but I'm pretty sure that's maybe already a chrismon. And so this is just a slight take on that. But this passage from the Exodus is one of those very like visually in a a representation of God coming between his people and Pharaoh's army to protect them and to deliver them into safety. Rachel, would you go ahead and read Hosea 2, please? And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. So one of the other reasons I picked Umbrella is is sort of this notion of safety, that this is, this is God's ideal for us, is to be with him and with others in safety. And so an umbrella is one of those things, I think, when you're caught in a rainstorm, whether you're walking into work or you're outside and there's, you know, just an emergency downpour because that happens sometimes. Emergency um, downpour? Yeah, emergency downpour. <laughs> it happens all the time. It's a meteorological term. Google it. Her brother is a meteorologist, so she is a meteorologist. I really uh-huh. want to know now. I'm going yeah, to Google it. Not. Ask it's Luther. Not. He knows all maybe, about emergency maybe, downpours. Maybe an emergency <laughs> umbrella for sudden downpours. Maybe. Maybe that's what I meant. Just I own know. it. Emergency downpours. Emergency I love down- it. I'm owning it. I love it. But it's it's good. It's a good and handy thing to have to keep yourself safe and out of the elements. And furthermore, especially here in the Midwest, when the summer weather is just awful sometimes and the storms are terrifying, I am constantly reminded of this passage from Matthew 8 that when (laughs) it's kind of a stretch, but like when we when we carry an umbrella with us, we can still be reminded that when the weather seems crazy or we're put out by a flood or take damage from a tornado like God is always in control and that's not even a platitude like that's it's for real because we read here in Matthew 8 that God's got it under control so go ahead Aaron and when he got into the boat his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves but he was asleep And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? I want to clarify in in what I said before about, especially when it comes to disasters, I don't mean to minimize any of that because those can be very life-altering tragic things 
even if you thought about some like everyday incident where I'm walking into work and there is an emergency downpour and I'm like, save me, Jesus, this is stupid and terrible. And he can, he comes in and he says, look, calm down, have faith. I got this covered, man. Chill out. I think having an umbrella with you is helpful, but it's also a reminder that God's got you taken care of. It's true. Isn't there a part of the liturgy, I want to say in Compline, that talks about hiding me in the shadow of your wings, which is really a similar imagery. Let me see if I can. I'm relying on Sarah for this because I'm not a. Compl- my hymnal is in my stack of books. of prayer. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. Okay. Um, I think I got it. Le- hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in, the, me shadow in the shadow of your, of your wings. wings. In righteousness, I shall see you when I awake. Your presence will give me joy. And obviously, shadow of your wings isn't quite the same as shadow of your umbrella. But I think it's very parallel. Yeah. That Hide me under is- your umbrella. Yeah. I'd say it. And he'd be mm-hmm. like, you would know what we're talking about. It's fine. All right, ladies. We're at the end here. Okay. Okay. We have submitted for the approval of the Chrismon Society for next generation symbols. We have the umbrella, the bar of soap, a roll of duct tape, and a pineapple. This fifth one was also inspired by an episode of the podcast that we (laughs) recorded earlier this year. I have touted this item as the pinnacle of what it means to be a Lutheran woman. And I also think that it's it can be a symbol of God's goodness and graciousness. And if we can't get this item canonized as a Chrismon symbol, I don't know what hope we have. <laughs> I'm kidding. We know, we know what our hope is, but still, this is a good one and they should accept it. Sarah, will you go to Matthew 20? You're going to be reading verses 26 and 28. And then Rachel, Acts 2. Verses 42 through 47, which I think is maybe my favorite part of the entire Bible. Fun fact. Memorize it for when there's a Lutheran Ladies Lounge (laughs) trivia category. (laughs) Trivia night category. So the item that I talked about during our anniversary episode was the ladle. Yes. And so for similar reasons, I think we should look at the ladle as sort of a reminder of the nature of, of both god and the nature of our lives together as christians so sarah please go ahead and proceed with matthew chapter 20 verses 26 through 28 all right it shall not be so among you but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave even as the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so the ladle which arguably is the ultimate serving utensil, (laughs) reminds us that Jesus was the ultimate servant. He's the the suffering servant. Is that like an ecumenical term or is that a specifically Lutheran, like we read about that in the catechism? It's in Isaiah. Suffering servant is from Isaiah. Suffering servant like a term. Okay, I wasn't sure. But But we do, I mean, Lutherans do add an extra emphasis on the suffering part. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like that's in our nature. So, I mean, he... (laughs) He was all powerful. He is all God. And yet he came to us as like a tiny, just little vulnerable baby and grew up to be a man and sacrificed his life for us. That is the grand, that's the greatest act of service that I can think of that somebody would do for anyone. And the fact that he lived a perfect life and still bore our sins for us and died for them is i mean that's that is the ultimate in servitude and because of that because of what he's done for us it it shows us how we should live together so rachel in acts 2 if you would read that we can look to the ladle as its main use reminding us of the community that we share as believers all right acts 2 verse 42 and following Yes. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So as much as we joke on the show about (laughs) the power of soup suppers and potlucks and ice cream (laughs) socials and stuff, like, again, I will just remind everybody that that is those times of fellowship and service to each other. I mean, that's that's sacred. Like, that's straight up like heavenly stuff. And so when we when we look at, at something as simple as a ladle, we can still see so much of who we are as Christians and, and who God has made us out to be. Rounding out our list at number five of next generation Chrismons is the ladle. Yes, ma'am. I love it. Very I nice. love that I love that ladles are not appropriate for single serving meals for the most part. That this is mostly for when you're in a big group setting and that you know that whoever's holding the ladle is probably going to be eating last. Yep. (laughs) That there's an element of selflessness in that ladle holder position and Mm -hmm. makes it a great symbol. They may not die for you, but they'll make sure you eat first. And that's pretty cool too. (laughs) That's what my husband and I did at our wedding reception. Instead of having that a receiving is fun line, as heck. As, instead of having a receiving line at church, we were the ones that served everybody's food in the buffet That's line. Oh, that was really cool. That is. That's fun. Did your dress survive? We also got special aprons to put there on over our fancy fo- and over our fancy clothes. That's you yep. think of everything. <laughs> you do. Oh my god! It was Luther's idea. I can't take credit for that. He wanted to do that. He thought it would be a cool you. serving thing at our wedding. Wow. He Great was idea. right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, ladies, thank you, thank you for indulging my creativity <laughs> and my prayer in all seriousness for for you all and everyone listening in podcast land to as we enter into Advent and reflect upon Jesus coming to earth as a baby and beginning his ministry that you see sort of the divine in in everyday things. Jesus was a man. He was by no means common and he was still God, but he was human like us. And so in the same way, I th- I would encourage you to think about why certain things around your house or in your office or or in your car, how those things might remind you of of the characteristics of of our loving God and and how we are to live with each other, both this Advent season and beyond. Thank you. I also have some more great news for you. I'm not making you guys make Chris Mons this year. <laughs> no, I very much appreciate the participation last year. Much appreciated. However, that was really fun. That was yeah. really my, fun. My fingers ached afterwards, though. Is <laughs> my gift to the ladies in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Facebook group. I will be designing slash creating nine by 12 custom arts for the five next generation chrismons i will have to get with the admins to figure out how we're gonna do that giveaway but (laughs) i didn't want to go this year without getting something out to people but also taking the burden off of felting a holy hand grenade of antioch (laughs) (laughs) like bead anchors and stuff (laughs) Awesome. Okay, I am ridiculously excited about this. I kind of think I'm going to have to start a Facebook profile that is like anonymous. Let's see, we'll say I will be Katie Murgatroyd Luther and <laughs> sign up for this giveaway because a, are you, are you ready a, a free Grzebski not- original Christmas Christmas artwork sounds epic. <laughs> I mean, I could. you could have just also asked me to do one for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to yeah, okay. <laughs> okay maybe this is my way of asking but also yeah. saying anyone out there if you get a chance yeah. to sign up for this giveaway do it because i'm super jealous <laughs> i'm so glad i'm not glad that you're jealous but i'm so glad you're excited it's a great idea it's gonna be super fun brie we Thank love you. christmans 
I have so many ideas for Christmas presents now, too. And pineapples. I need to put and pineapples like, everywhere. <laughs> if you get someone an umbrella for Christmas, like, how can somebody be mad at that? As a <laughs> kid, I'd be like, Mom, this is garbage. But now I'd be like, oh... Uh -huh. You care about me. You care. My kids only wish they Sorry. got umbrellas for Christmas. <laughs> Did they get bars of soap? <laughs> <laughs> if they're good. <laughs> oh, that's on the finger. <laughs> but that's all I got. I think it's great. Ladies, if you want to hear the first episode, we'll link that somewhere in the Facebook group. So you can go back and find all of the, the, the funsies from the first time around. We talked about Christmas and all of the history. <laughs> Join us in the Facebook group also for the giveaway. It's going to be super great. You're going to want one of these original Brie Krasovsky pieces of artwork because we all want one. <laughs> find us on Facebook in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. Find all of our episodes at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Join our community on Facebook in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. Uh, my mom used to sing this song with the girls called Pineapple Princess. I can't remember the words, but <laughs> I'm not just a pineapple. I'm a pineapple princess. <laughs> Noise. <laughs> Sarah. Oh my goodness, it was a song by Annette Funicello. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it.